Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning or good evening if you're in Asia. My name is Yuka Koshino, and I'm the Research Fellow for Japanese Security and Defense Policy at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. It is my pleasure to welcome you all today to this webinar on the topic of space and emerging domain of conflict. Today, we are very fortunate to have three terrific speakers. Our first speaker is Frank Rose, joining us from Washington, DC. He's a senior fellow for security and strategy in the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution, where he focuses on nuclear strategy and deterrence, arms control, outer space, and emerging security challenges. He previously served at the Obama administration, first as a deputy assistant secretary of state for space and defense policy from 2009 to 2014, and as assistant secretary for arms control verification and compliance from 2014 to 2017. He was the founder of the US-China security, space security talks, which I'm sure he would comment on during his presentation. Our second speaker is Peter Round, joining us from the UK. He's our consulting senior fellow for European defense at the WIWS and executive chairman of Clio Space, a Luxembourg-based geospatial intelligence gathering startup working in new space. He previously served as the capabilities director at the European Defense Agency and as UK's national liaison representative to NATO Supreme Allied Commander Transformation in Virginia. He has served in the Royal Air Force for 32 years. Our, our final speaker today is Timothy Wright with the Missile Dialogue Initiative at the WIWS's Defense and Military Analysis Program. He is a passionate space watcher at the Institute and provides research and analysis on missiles and anti-satellite weapons. Before we start, I like to outline the order of play today and some housekeeping rules. Each speaker will have eight minutes, around eight minutes for opening remarks, followed by a discussion and a Q&A session. The webinar will last around an hour. There are two ways to take part in the discussion and to ask questions. You could either raise a hand, the blue hand, to ask a question directly to the speakers, or you can write your questions at any time during a webinar. Please state your affiliation when asking or writing your questions. I will, however, need to be strict with time, so if you would like to ask a question to the speakers directly, please limit yourself to one question and, um, and not statements. Finally, the webinar will be recorded and will be posted on the WIWS website. With that, now I would like to hand over the discussion to Frank. Thanks very much, Yuka. It's a pleasure to join you and the other panelists here uh, this morning in Washington. Uh, in my brief remarks today, I'd like to accomplish two primary objectives. One, identify what I believe are the three most pressing challenges to the long-term security and sustainability of the outer space environment. And two, propose some solutions to how we might manage these challenges. Um, I believe there are three primary challenges to the security and sustainability of the outer space environment. The growth of orbital debris, the rise of mega constellations of small satellites, and the deployment of anti-satellite weapons or ASAT weapons by countries like Russia and China. Let me briefly say a few words about each of these challenges starting with orbital debris. Decades of space activity have littered the Earth's orbit with defunct satellites in pieces of orbital debris. Uh, indeed, the US Department of Defense is currently tracking over 26,000 pieces of orbital debris, 10 centimeters or larger in various Earth orbits. And there are about 600,000 pieces of small of uh, smaller pieces of debris that we just don't have the technical capability to track right now, though that is uh, capability is improving. And because of the high speeds in which these objects travel in space, 17,500 miles per hour, even a sub millimeter piece of debris could cause a problem for human or robotic space missions. Now, some of this debris is the result of routine space operations, while others are a result of deliberative acts or accidents. On that note, I'd like to focus your attention on two specific events that occurred in 2007 and 2009, respectively. 
In 2007, China conducted a destructive anti-satellite test against one of its own satellites at around 865 kilometers in orbit. That single event created over 3,000 pieces of debris larger than 10 centimeters and will stay in low Earth orbit for potentially hundreds of years, presenting an ongoing threat to the space systems of all nations, including China. Uh, in 2009, there was an accidental collision between a Russian Cosmos satellite and a, a commercially operated Iridium satellite. These two events are responsible for almost one third of the debris in low Earth, Earth orbit. So the growth of orbital debris is a major problem that's growing and needs to be addressed. The second key challenge facing the outer space environment is the development of mega constellations of small satellites. Several US, European, and Chinese entities have plans to launch mega constellations in the coming year. In November of 2018, the US Federal Communications uh, Commission approved a request by SpaceX to construct, deploy, and operate a very low Earth constellation of more than 12,000 small satellites called Starlink. And SpaceX has asked at the FCC to approve an additional 30,000 of these satellites for a total constellation of 42,000. While these mega constellations will improve space-based capabilities, they will also contribute significantly to congestion in low Earth orbit. The third key challenge to the outer space environment is the growing anti-satellite threat or ASAT threat. Countries like Russia and China understand that space-based assets are key to the ability of the United States and its allies to conduct modern military operations. The ability to deny the United States and its allies access to space-derived data and information would provide adversaries significant military advantages. As former U.S. Director of National Intelligence Dan Coates noted in testimony before Congress in 2019, quote, China and Russia are training and equipping their military space forces and fielding new anti-satellite weapons to hold U.S. and allied space services at risk. Both countries recognize the world's growing reliance on space and view the capability to attack space services as part of their broader effort to deter an adversary or defeat one in combat, end quote. So given these challenges to the space environment, what approach should the United States and its allies take in response? In many ways, the United States and its allies face a fundamental dilemma as they attempt to ensure the long-term security and sustainability of the outer space environment. On one hand, Russia and China's development of anti-satellite weapons represent a direct threat to U.S. and allied space systems. On the other hand, it is difficult to see how the United States and its allies will be able to address some of the key challenges facing out, uh, the outer space environment like orbital debris without directly engaging Russia and China. Recognizing this dilemma, let me provide some recommendations that could serve as a basis for a potential strategy for managing this dilemma. First, I think the United States and its allies must continue their efforts to enhance deterrence and increase the resiliency of their space systems against the growing ASAT threat. Second, the United States and its allies should work with the broader international community, including Russia and China, to develop a stronger norm against the creation of long-lived debris in outer space. One step that I would recommend is to develop an international ban or limitation on further debris generating events in outer space like China's 2007 ASAT test. Third, the United States must do a better job engaging China on a bilateral basis 
on outer space security and sustainability issues. One of the easiest things it could do would be to restart the US-China space security talks, which I founded and led during the Obama administration. These talks were last held in December 2016. Fourth, the international community needs to begin a diplomatic discussion on how to manage the rise of mega satellite constellations. While these constellations have the potential to provide significant benefits, uh, they need to be operated in a way that is consistent with the long-term sustainability of the outer space environment. Um, so let me just conclude by saying, uh, as the 2017 U.S. National Security Strategy stated, we have returned to an era of competition with countries like Russia and China. Uh, but as my colleague uh, Tom Wright, not Tim Wright, uh, also the Brookings Institution, outlined in his excellent book, All Measures Short of War, quote, as the United States competes with Russia and China, it cannot lose sight of the many areas in which the United States must cooperate with its rivals out of shared interests. The issue is whether it is possible to cooperate on these problems while competing on others, end quote. And this is the essential balance we have to strike regarding outer space finding a way to work with states like Russia and China on space sustainability and safety issues, while at the same time pushing back on security issues where necessary. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, our second speaker is Pete. Pete, you have the floor. Great, thank you uh, very much, Rika, and uh, thanks to the IISS for giving me this opportunity and, uh, and to Frank and Tim particularly for letting me join uh, such august company. Um, I'm only going to make a, a few brief remarks focusing on the so-called uh, new space, which is the bit of space I'm involved in, and trying to emphasise how this needs to affect defence thinking. And by defence, I don't just mean uh, the concept of risk and threat militarily, but I also mean the practitioners who have to use these concepts as well as perhaps the prime contractors and others who might be traditionally supporting uh, the defence effort. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about what is new space. Um, many of you out there will know, some of you may not. What capabilities can it bring to defence? What challenges does new space create? And then perhaps uh, a few words to match the question on uh, emerging domains of conflict. So moving on to what is new space? Well, new space is wide scale commercial use of space. Now, I can hear voices saying, well, space has always been used commercially, whether that's uh, uh, videos of the home, TV, satellites, uh, navigation, or that came from the military and other things. Space has always been used commercially. It has, but it, is, it has needed massive investment to achieve that. Long term planning, massive investment, often government uh, engagement in putting the assets into place and almost almost government engagement in placing the assets physically, by that I mean launch capability. The next issue of new space is simple and quick to build satellites. How quickly can we go from an idea, a concept of what we want to do for space to actually having a capability in space? Part of that is how do you build a satellite? CubeSats, small sats, call them as you will, have been around quite a long time. But the skill sets needed to build them are widening. There's more competition out there. You can go out there and tender for your satellites to be built by different companies in different parts of the world. And equally, how do I get my satellites into space? <clears throat> it has become cheaper to launch satellites. And even during the current crisis over the last 12 months, we've seen the price of launching come down. That doesn't mean there's not risk associated with launch. We know there is. We saw uh, Rocket Labs have a problem a couple of weeks ago and Vega about a year ago. But the risks are reducing, the costs are reducing. But there are limitations. How long do these satellites last? Those of you who are involved in space and defense know that many satellite constellations live longer than they were ever expected to, which is jolly good for the defense planners who may not have been quite as ready for replacement as they should have been. But they are living on. Um, but the small sats won't. They will have a limited lifespan of less than uh, five years or five years or so. In fact, I can pay uh, a little homage to what Frank was saying. Uh, we do need small satellite operators to be responsible to make sure at the end of the lives 
of those satellites, they've fulfilled all the requirements to make sure those satellites drop out of orbit and are completely destroyed and do not add to the, uh, the problem uh, of space debris. De uh, debris. But what all this creates is opportunities in space which were previously unaffordable. Unless you were a nation state, a nation actor, you couldn't do this in space. So we're seeing new players. Now new players, as in all businesses, could be good or could be bad, and I will touch on uh, bad in a minute or two. But it leads to that freedom of access, the freedom of access to space and the freedom of access that comes from space. So what does come from space? What capabilities can this new space bring to defence? What should we be worrying about or what should we be taking the opportunity to use? Well, certainly electro-optical uh, sensors, uh, synthetic aperture radars, uh, radio frequency detection and geolocation suddenly become available on um, uh, a wider basis. And um, those of you who spent hours in lockdown on the internet will know how easy it is actually to go online and buy pretty good uh, uh, data almost directly, put a credit card in and get a, uh, get, um, uh, a picture back. And um, therein lies an issue for those who maybe have areas uh, that they want to uh, keep a little more secret. And what about reactivity? Um, by reactivity, I, I mean how quickly can the deliverer of the data react to a need for different data? Now, clearly, if we're using a traditional military air breathing asset, a maritime patrol aircraft, a reconnaissance uh, a jet or a, uh, a UAV, then the ability to ch <coughs> change the sensors is pretty much as quickly as it takes or as long as it takes for the, you, the aircraft to recover back to base, sensors to be changed if those sensors exist, and then the thing's set and back out there, which is probably measured in hours. And in space, historically, reactivity and putting a sensor into space took years. An idea, raising the fund, building the satellite, launching it took forever. Well, now we have new space. And realistically, if you are trying to do something in space where there is a sensor around, that's, in other words, you're not creating the sensor, and you decide that you want to put that capability into space, you really can go from an idea to having a capability transmitting to the Earth, theoretically, in six months. Nine months, certainly. Six months, if you really try. Now, there's a remarkable uh, rate of ability to change and react to a threat against you by putting a sensor into place. A sensor which is not constrained by political and landmass borders and limitations. But also with these prices, with this uh, ease, comes the ability to have quantity. And um, we heard Frank talk about tens of thousands of satellites in some usage scenarios. <clears throat> Perhaps I'm not talking quite as many as that, but you can certainly put a lot of satellites and maybe in a radio frequency uh, situation that I'm uh, uh, more of a specialist in, 10 clusters of satellites, 15 clusters of satellites, and you've got real-time worldwide coverage. And if you think of the speed and the cost, you can do that uh, very easily indeed. And by putting that number of satellites into space, you create a resilience. Someone's trying to take you down and you have many, it is harder to jam, harder to shoot down, harder to detect. Uh, all and also be sure for an adversary they have got all the sensors if you have many. So what are the challenges created by new space internally and externally? Well first is a threat to old ways. <clears throat> Historically for the space actors uh, and by that I mean many of the prime contractors, a, a good space program has been, has been a good deal in that you've got a five or seven year development program followed by a uh, building of a, uh, of a satellite the size of a, uh, of a car then uh, slinging it into space at great expense and then 25 years or so maybe more operating this marvellous satellite. So actually new space has created a threat uh, because it's a new way of doing things and that has been reacted to in a, a number of different ways, disbelief, um, uh, questions of it must be cheap, it's too cheap, how can it possibly work, it's too small, how can something that work deliver? Um, so we get they can't possibly work, won't work, I still don't believe it works, even when presented with the evidence that it does work. So there's been uh, an effort to overcome resistance from the traditional space actors, be that the agencies, prime contractors or defence. Nevertheless, that resistance is starting uh, to fall. Then you start to get questions on how do I integrate this new data? How do I buy it? Where do I get it from? Is it safe? Do I trust to in in integrate it into my systems? 
who else has got it? Who is this pesky commercial firm selling this data to? And how do I make sure it's only me that's got it? And certainly if it's not only me that's got it, how do I ensure uh, only a good guy's got it? And even if I get this data, do I trust it? Um, so there are some really big questions for uh, organizations who can see this myriad of data, this forest, this ocean of data out there, but are unsure how to use it. So we have to sort out how the primes and new space can work together. And in some cases, the new space is in the primes, of course, and how the space nations work with new space, knowing that they have traditional ways of working with space, but also there are other uh, organizations that are suddenly gonna have space that they haven't got before. So turning to the question of an emerging domain of conflict, greater access equals greater use equals a greater perceived threat. So what do I do about new space? There's uncertainty about the capability. How many? Where are they? What can they do? Are they any good? And a phrase we used to use in the good old days of the Cold War when I had more hair, uh, quality, uh, quantity has a quality of its own. If you've got an awful lot of it, it's really hard to counter. And resilience comes from that. Many gives you resilience. Small, multiple targets, difficult to prosecute. And also more nations have access to space. Smaller nations that have not previously had that huge amount of money to spend on space can get into space and start getting data. And there's a throwaway line as I close, I mentioned what about a non-national actor having access to space? I remind you that it wasn't many years ago we were told that drug smugglers couldn't possibly build a submarine to smuggle drugs. Well, they did, they have, and they've done it effectively. What do we do when a nefarious actor gets hold of a new space capability and decides to use it against us? I'll close at that point. Thank you very much, Pete. Now I would like to move on to the, the last speaker, Tim, please. Uh, thank you very much, Yuka. Um, Frank, thank you also to, uh, to Frank and Pepita and for everyone to, uh, for joining us today. Uh, so in my remarks, um, I'd like to cover four points. First, I just really want to briefly introduce some of the major counter space components. Second, I'll discuss some of the drivers for introducing those technologies. Third, I'll share with you, with you a few of the risks associated with those technologies. And finally, I want to provide an assessment of what this means for the future of the space domain. So first, a quick overview of some of these components. So counter space components come in a variety of forms in terms of their type, their effects, whether they're reversible or not, the level of sophistication required, and also the ability to determine attribution. So maybe first look, we'll look at cyberspace threats. So these target the data and the systems which are using that data. They can be reversible or irreversible, depending on what is done to the system. Uh, a cyber attack might be used for data interception and monitoring, or a hacker might be able to issue instructions to a space-based asset results in the destruction or the degradation of the satellite. Electronic warfare uses jamming and spoofing techniques to interfere or distort with communications to and from satellites. Now, the effects of this are reversible. Once a jammer is turned off, the signal will return to its normal. It's also relatively inexpensive as well. Most of the technology needing to jam many types of satellites is already commercially available. Getting a little bit more sophisticated, looking at direct, directed energy weapons. Now these are systems which use directed energy to disrupt, damage, or destroy their targets. Directed energy weapons have reversible and irreversible effects. So a laser could be used to dazzle or damage a target satellite image sensor. Uh, so for instance, Russia is developing an airborne laser, the Sokol Eskolon, or Echelon, if I pronounce that correctly, uh, which is derived from an earlier Soviet program titled A60. Uh, this system's purpose is to, uh, to target the optical sensors of imagery reconnaissance satellites. This laser was actually used in a 2009 experiment to illuminate a Japanese satellite, which was at an orbital height of around 1,500 kilometers. Now, getting much more destructive, we have co-orbital threats. Now, these are satellites which are placed into orbit and then maneuver closer to their designated targets. Again, they may cause reversible or irreversible damage. So for instance, a robotic arm might be used to grapple and interfere with the orbit of a target satellite or potentially damage or destroy its equipment. It might also carry potentially a chemical spray or radio jamming, radio jamming equipment to just have a, 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 a smaller interference with it. And finally, as Frank, Frank has discussed, we've also got ASATs. Now, obviously the damage of these systems is, is, is irreversible. Raytheon described their kinetic kill vehicle as having the power of a 10-ton truck traveling at 600 miles per hour. Uh, 
And we can see how destructive they are looking at the Chinese test in 2007, which created thousands of pieces of debris. Now, although there is a renewed focus on counter space uh, capabilities, many of the concepts themselves are not actually that new. Both the Soviet Union and the United States developed counter space capabilities during the Cold War. But the crucial difference, and I think Peter's hit on this, is that the barriers to entry, both for space and counter space assets, are now much lower. And many states are restructuring and making organizational changes to their space policies. So, for example, Russia's 2014 military doctrine emphasized space as a war fighting domain. And likewise, China's 2015 defense white paper officially designated space as a military domain. And in 2016, it created the Strategic Support Force which was tasked with developing and employing most of the PLA's space warfare capabilities. In the last 12 months or so, we've seen some very significant developments in space policies and doctrine, especially in the West. The US re-established the, the United States Space Command to take over space war fighting duties from US STRATCOM, and the Trump administration also created the Space Force as a new military service within the Department of the Air Force to independently operate, train, and equip US Space Forces. In Europe, we've seen French, Emmanuel, French President Emmanuel Macron approve the creation of a space command within the French Air Force, uh, which would include protecting satellites in an active manner. In Asia, the Japanese government recently passed a bill to set up the Space Domain Mission Unit. And just over a year ago, India tested a, uh, successfully tested an ASAT system against one of its own micro satellites. Now, all of these developments, they reinforce the notion that space is and will be a future domain of conflict. And this leads me then to my next section, what are the drivers for some states to develop and deploy such systems? The first is the centrality of space to conventional military operations. Although space assets and counter space assets were developed and deployed during the Cold War, they were mostly, but not entirely, linked to command and control of nuclear systems, as well as missile warning assets to detect potential nuclear attack. Now this provided essentially an element of deterrence from attack. An adversary of, of space, sorry, an attack on space assets might be assessed as being a preemptive attack to limit an adversary's ability to launch a second strike. But however, today, many space-based systems now directly support conventional military operations. So for instance, communication satellite provide voice communications and data transfer for military users. Intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance satellites provide signals intelligence, warning notifications, battle damage assessments, military force disposition, and positioning, navigation, and timing satellites provide data that enables militaries to determine their precise location and time. Now, while space-based systems did provide the United States with a conventional military edge over actual and potential opponents, and this is most acutely on display during the first Gulf War, other states did take note of this and have since developed capabilities to undermine this advantage by developing and deploying these systems. Moving on, space has also become an area of geostrategic competition among major space powers. Regional and global competition has driven some decision makers to advocate for the development of counter space systems. So for instance, with China's 2007 ASAT test, in many ways it acted as a catalyst for other states to either demonstrate or develop their own ASAT capabilities. In the United States, about a year later, tested a, successfully tested an ASAT system of its own, although it utilized the standard missile three, uh, which is a ballistic missile defense system. But that was the first US ASAT test since 1985. And building on this in March 2019, uh, India also successfully conducted an ASAT test of Mission Shakti. India's decision to develop its own ASAT program has been, independent, has been assessed by many analysts as a signal to China that it also possesses the capability to hold Chinese space assets at risk in the event of a conflict. And also, I think, as Peter spoke a lot about, the barriers to entry for space and counter space capabilities have fallen. An increasing number of states and commercial actors are accessing space as technological and cost barriers have fallen. Now, this provides many benefits for daily activities on life on Earth, but our reliance on space, space assets has provided possible means for state and non-state actors to undermine their regional or international rivals. And although more sophisticated counter space elements, such as co-orbital co vehicles and ASAT systems out of the reach of many states, other capabilities have far lower barriers to entry. So for instance, electronic attacks, going back to jamming and spoofing, they're relatively inexpensive and can be employed by many states, as can cyber warfare measures. Now, as we have seen the targeting of military and commercial sites on Earth, we've also seen cyber attacks against space-based assets. So for instance, the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission found in 2011 at least four occasions where US environment monitoring satellites have been interfered with. 
In fact, although no damage was done, the cyber attackers in one instance managed to require managed to achieve all the required steps to command the targeted satellite without actually ever exercising that control. So unlike some ca counter space capabilities such as ASATs, cyber attacks can be very difficult to attribute as, as attackers may conceal their identity, such as by hijacking servers and launching an attack. Finally, just briefly touching on the weakening of international norms. Now norms are more likely to be broken when many actors enter a field and there are few rules of the road. Now, although there is the, 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 uh, the format, although the formation of the United Nations Commission, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space in 1959 and the 1967 Outer Space Treaty quickly established some norms, subsequent multilateral treaties to regulate those norms and behaviours have re received less attention from the international community. So this then brings me to my next point. What are some of the dangers of developing and deploying these systems? Frank has already discussed, co has already discussed orbital debris, so I don't wish to overlap it too much. Something else that I'd like to add is, a is about a further risk of counter space technologies is the potential for misinterpretation or miscalculation that might drive escalatory dynamics. So for instance, an attack by a nuclear armed power against another space based assets in a peer conflict could potentially elicit a worst case analysis by decision makers, which results in an escalatory spiral. Now, some nuclear weapon states do reserve the right to use nuclear weapons if their command and control systems are under attack. So, for instance, in Russia's new 2020 nuclear deterrence policy, it was an expansion on the previous 2014 version, representing a new scenario whereby, and I quote, an attack by an adversary against critical governmental or military sites of the Ru Russian Federation, disruption of which would undermine nuclear forces response actions, end quote, is a scenario which might warrant a nuclear weapon response by Moscow. So given the potential dangers for mis misinterpretation or miscalculation that might arise from the use of counter space weapons, I'd like to finish by providing an assessment on what this means for the future of the space domain. So although the weaponization of space isn't inevitable, the behavior of some states also now suggested is quite likely. The proposals to limit some counter space systems have been so far been unsuccessful. The US rejected a joint Russian and Chinese initiative in 2014 and 2008 due to a lack of verification mechanisms in the proposal and also because it didn't actually tackle the issue of ASATs. The European Union's proposal for a legally binding International Space Code of Conduct drafted in 2008, revised in 2011 and 2014 has also made little headway. So then in the near term, then maybe normative behavior, rules of the road, perhaps agreeing a minimum separation of distance between maneuvering satellites, or a, or a temporary delay on the testing of ASAT systems might be the most realistic outcome given this deadlock. Well, uh, I'll wrap up there. Thanks, Yuka, and um, looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Tim, and thank you all the speakers for such a fascinating opening comments, and we have so many things to discuss. So now we would like to uh, move on to the Q&As. We have about 30 minutes. And I do have some questions, but um, if you have some questions, please either raise, the ha raise your blue hand or um, continue to type in the Q&A sections. So as a moderator, I would like to um, ask several first questions. Um, so Frank, you um, laid out about how it's important to balance engagement in, uh, in competitions, and you briefly mentioned about how allies can cooperate more to, to first um, deter the space threats. And as a, I'm a, as, a Jap, as a researcher focusing on Japan, so for instance, Japan has established um, the space squadron and has been enhancing cooperation under the US-Japan security guidelines that was upgraded in 2015, and I'm sure you were involved in, during the Obama administrations. So how would you um, say that maybe um, other countries can learn from these experiences and how can the network of allies um, do more to enhance resilience in space? Great, thanks Yuka. Uh, let me start by just pro providing a little background on Japan and, and outer space security. I, I would say of all US partners, Japan is probably one of the most serious when it comes to space security. Uh, and I think there were two events that served as a wake up call for Japan. Uh, the first was North Korea's missile test that overflew Japan in 1998. And the second was in 2007 when China conducted its first ASAT test. Uh, this really was a wake up call for Japan. And in 2008, they amended their uh, basic space law uh, 
that in allowed the Japanese military to specifically use outer space for national security uh, space activities. Prior to that, uh, there were serious limitations on how the Japanese military could use space. Um, and this opened up a lot of opportunities for joint US Japan cooperation in the context of the alliance. In 2010, uh, we set up the US Japan Space Security Dialogue, which I had uh, the pleasure to found. And it really started focusing that bilateral co cooperation between the two nations. And it culminated in the uh, revision of the 2015 defense guidelines. In these US-Japan guidelines now, for the first time ever, you had outer space play a key role. Because uh, I think there was a view in both capitals that space was critical to updating the relevance of the alliance to deal with emerging challenges of the 21st century. Uh, so I would say Japan is well ahead of most of our allies. But as Tim noted in his opening remarks, a number of other allies like France and Germany are uh, right behind them. So what can these other allies do? Well, I would say there are three areas where I would focus my attention. Uh, the first is improving our shared space situational awareness or SSA capabilities. You have a number of allies around the world who have very good SSA capabilities, whether they be satellites, telescopes, or radars. Uh, the more that they can integrate their data with the United States, uh, the better the picture of what's going on up in space will be. So that's number one. Number two, they should work with the United States to improve the resiliency of their respective, uh, respective architectures. Uh, one of the uh, excellent examples of this is that Japan will host a SSA uh, payload on one of their new QZSS uh, satellites. So working to kind of improve the resiliency of the space architectures to make it more difficult for potential adversaries to target um, systems is another area. And, and third, and I think part of this is on the United States, is ensuring that our allies are integrated in space war games and planning. Um, you know, the United States hosts a number of annual space war games like the Schriever War Game, ensuring that allies are an active part of those war games, uh, I think will be critical. And as the United States stands up the Space Force, I think it's also going to be critical that the Space Force establishes connective tissue with allies around the world, whether it be in Asia, Europe, the Middle East, wherever. So bottom line, if you look at the recent US uh, defense space strategy, cooperation at, uh, with allies is at the heart of that strategy. I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, the United States is in competition with Russia and China, and our allies are one of our key asymmetric advantages in that competition. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. Um, so I have my next question is to Pete. Um, so you mentioned a lot about the new space and um, and how the new space is lowering the barriers for countries to enter the space. Um, domain. And I was wondering if a country wanted to aspire to become a space nation, like you mentioned, what are the most important things um, that the governments can do? And what kind of governments are most capable of developing a space nation? Well, um, yeah, good question. I think that um, uh, the key message is that if you want to go into space, if a government decides it wants to go into space, then um, at the most um, simple level, uh, it is it is quite uh, easy now to using space brokers and uh, uh, for launch capability and for uh, and for tendering for satellites to be built. 
to, to get that done commercially uh, outside one's own country. So the ability to buy in the capability uh, and buy in the, uh, the, uh, uh, the equipment you need uh, can be done quite quickly and quite effectively. Most, of course, the nations don't want to do it like that. What they want is to have a, a real space capability in their country. And there are quite a few countries around who have a long tradition of it. There's the, the obvious ones that have popped up in our conversations here, uh, you know, India, um, UK, US, of course, uh, uh, China, Russia, and so on, who have a, a long space tradition. But actually, hidden away are one or two other countries as well, which, which are there. Um, and I give an example of Luxembourg as a uh, a major civilian satellite operator in in, in the video uh, arena. Now what they've done is taken their big presence in space and taken it a little bit further. They've introduced a space law which has been looked at by a number of countries including uh, the US because it sets in place um, uh, within the principles of the UN that space is for everybody, a way of operating in space, a way of understanding ownership in space, how, do, how who, who can profit from space, who owns the assets in space. By doing that to set a legal framework in which companies can operate and which, uh, oper in which uh, other organisations can operate, operating a good, uh, a good technical, um, a good technical environment where uh, where scientists and specialists want to go to the country will lead quite naturally on to uh, uh, being able to develop such a capability. But let's go back to question one, which is if a country wants a space capability, what does it want that capability to do? Is this going to be a uh, defence capability? Will it be a humanitarian capability? So I'll give you an example of a humanitarian capability. Uh, I'll give two very briefly. One is fishery protection, which is more obvious. This is detection of uh, fish attractors that are thrown in the ocean. And then when the fish have arrived, or the factory fishes go and just suck them out of the ocean. And another one, which is um, looking after people, uh, people migration. And this is where uh, 10 years ago, even perhaps five years ago, people migration was driven by, uh, often uh, people were moving from places of conflict or starvation to, to better places. And they were doing that uh, via water courses and tracks and places they've been before. Today, there's a modification on that navigation, which is where can they get a mobile phone signal from? So there's uh, a call from NGOs as to tell me where uh, uh, cell phone masks are in some of the more out of way places in the world because often the governments of those countries don't know where they are. Uh, and even if they do, they're not telling. So decide what capability you want. If you've got, a diff if you've got an industrial and scientific uh, um, establishment already there, then new space is very achievable. Thank you, Pete. And my, um, my quick question to Tim. Um, so you mentioned a lot about the threats from the major space powers. Um, did you have any countries that are not necessarily major space um, powers that we need to be worried about. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Yuka. Um, yeah, maybe just to very, very quickly talk about Iran and uh, North Korea. I mean, Iran has got a growing electronic and, uh, and cyber warfare capabilities, um, as does DPRK. Um, maybe just a couple of quick examples. So um, Tehran has, has been uh, accused on a number of occasions of jamming um, commercial communication satellites from broadcasting media in Iran. Uh, in 2012, there was a case where South Korea accused the North of uh, jamming ROK um, GPS signals, which affected South Korean aviation and uh, naval users. So, you know, although they're not going to have an ASAT capability or anything like that anytime soon, I think that they are, you know, using asymmetric warfare means, um, you know, that's uh, in proportion to their, to their capabilities and their resources, and they're proving to be quite effective at doing that. Thank you. Um, so I have some blue hands up. I would like to call um, Yogendra Kumar, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I have uh, one question to the panelists, and that is in terms of the complexity as to how the challenges thrown by the conflation of weapon systems, which are nuclear and non-nuclear, as also the near earth and earth systems, weapon systems, which are also conflating. So you find the conflation of nuclear weapons and conventional weapons and the near earth systems and earth systems. How actually these complexities 
can be addressed if you want to devise a system of some kind of confidence building system. And now, of course, we have to add the artificial intelligence as well. Thank you. Okay, um, who would like to answer first? Hey, Frank? Well, thanks for that question. I think one of the biggest challenges to developing space arms control proposals or norms of behavior is that many of the technologies that we find in outer space are inherently dual capable. Uh, for example, during the Cold War, the Soviets complained that the mechanical arm on the US space shuttle was an ASAT weapon because it can, uh, it could, space shuttle's not up there anymore, uh, grab and disable satellites. So that's the fundamental challenge you have is the dual capable nature of these systems. So instead of trying to define a space weapon, where I think the international community should focus their attention on is behavior that is verifiable. And that's one of the reasons why I have been uh, such a proponent of taking steps to limit the growth of orbital debris in outer space. Um, there are, are several proposals that for uh, debris uh, limitations or moratoriums that could be effectively verifiable. But as, the, um, uh, as our colleague noted, that is the big challenge, this dual capable nature of space systems. As I like to say, one person's debris removal system is another person's ASAT system. So my recommendation for those who are developing these rules of the road is to focus on behavior and focus on areas where there is a common objective and common purpose. And I think maintaining the sustainability of the space environment, especially preventing the growth of orbital debris is something all of the major space powers can agree on because orbital debris does not discriminate. Earlier in my presentation, I mentioned China's 2007 ASAT test. Seemed like a good idea at the time when they conducted the test. But since that 2007 ASAT test, there have been thousands of occasions where debris from that test have come close to China's own satellite and they've had to maneuver uh, their satellites to ensure there wasn't a collision. Um, so again, there's a, there are a number of practical things that major nations can do. And my recommendation to them is focus on the practical. Thank you, Frank. Um, Pete? Yeah, I, I think I just want to follow up uh, a little bit of what Frank says actually, because I think we, we do need nations uh, to understand uh, as best we can that uh, space is for the benefit of all and they need space whether they need it for their uh, peaceful or uh, their defense requirements but space is still a very very hostile environment if we look back uh, in our history uh, we don't have to look back far to where the biggest uh, the biggest challenge to an aviator was the very environment uh, an aviator being peace or war was far more likely to meet his end by uh, impacting, or her end, by impacting the ground uh, as a result of natural uh, phenomenon than they were by the action of, an, uh, of another actor. And space is a little bit like that. And when you add debris into it, which is all um, our, our own fault, you know, perhaps the equivalent of a, a modern vessel hitting a, a, a semi-submersed container floating in the sea, then we're just making life worse for ourselves. So we have to we have to take people forward in a, in, a, in, a, in a concept of mutual understanding and mutual benefit, particularly as unlike more traditional uh, arms control uh, regimes, verification is extremely difficult. Frank's point about debris in some cases is there's so much debris and some of it's so small we can't actually track it. So trying to verify uh, 
uh, a control regime is also difficult. So this is probably the hardest of diplomatic questions, which is to get uh, cooperation, uh, trust and honesty, whilst not really having uh, a particularly good method today of testing it. But we must approach it now and not leave it till it gets beyond control. Thank you. Um, Tim? Thanks, Yuka. Um, I think, I think uh, Frank um, touched on a really important thing of how do you define a space weapon and, you know, looking at the original question of looking at, you know, Earth, Earth systems or near-Earth systems, the mix of nuclear and conventional, I mean, many of these systems, as Frank says, are dual capable. And if you look at ballistic missile defense, I mean, mo some of these systems are exo-atmospheric and they're designed to strike ballistic missiles which are coming which are you know at, at uh, altitudes and speeds which is similar to that of a satellite um so you know it, it's it's very difficult to all of a sudden say well you can't have asats but then well what does that mean for ballistic missile defense and with you can just see with arms control treaties such as new start where the united states say well we want to start talking about tactical nuclear or non-strategic weapons the Russians say, well, okay, fine, but we want to talk about ballistic missile defense. And I think if you really want, you know, if, if there was going to be some really serious attempt at, uh, at uh, banning some of these systems, I think you're going to run into some of the really, you know, familiar problems that we have in, in, uh, in arms control. And ballistic missile defense, I think, is, is certainly going to be an issue there. Thank you. Although I mentioned that I'll be strict on time, we have a lot of questions and the speakers have agreed to um, stay on longer. So I would like to extend the discussion 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So next I would like to, um, there's two blue hands. So I would like to um, ask two of them to ask their questions. So first Jude Binder, please. Um, unmute. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, to uh, all the panelists, in regards to um, the space, domain and near space and as well outer space. Is there going to be a resurgence of like the same problem that was encountered like in the eighties, if the potential of a, what was it? A space race or the conception of the star Wars missile program by the United States or by the United States or any other nation state uh, space forces. Thank you. And the next question from Jacob Lipton, please. Hi, uh, you can hear me? Uh, I was wondering if you think that uh, in terms of great power competition in the space race, uh, there's any, uh, will, there, will there be any focus on spaceports uh, or a competition for them, for example, uh, in Baikonur in Central Asia? Uh, do you see that being a part of the space race? Thank you. Okay, um, who would like to go first? Can I go? Yeah. Um, so, so just to the first question, to Jude's question, is there you know, potential for a resurgence of a space race? And yes, there is. And I, I think you know, we, we have already seen that a little bit. Um, you know, I touched in my remarks on the, the Chinese test in 2007, which you know, acted in a bit of a way as a catalyst then for uh, the United States test the next year. I mean, the US did say that, okay, the, the satellite they shot down was uncommunicative and it also had a pretty toxic uh, fuel payload which needed to be um, disposed of. You know, they, had, they hadn't demonstrated that capability since 1985. Um, so I think it's, you know, a little bit more than coincidental. And India as well, I mean, you know, looking at the reason why it decided to develop an ASAT, um, I think it, it's done it entirely with China in mind. Um, so I think, you know, that you... It's, I don't think it's it's where it was in the 80s yet, but I think that there you know there are indications that there could potentially be a, a, a space race as you as you described. Frank, um, let me respond to the space-based missile defense question. Um, you know, Russia and China see U.S. space-based missile defenses as a potential existential threat to their strategic deterrent. And if you actually read the Russian and Chinese diplomatic proposals in the space security area, their PPWT treaty and their no first placement resolution in the United Nations, it's fundamentally focused on limiting the ability of the United States to deploy space-based missile defenses. 
Now, the issue of space-based missile defenses is a very divisive issue within the United States, whereas the overall missile defense program in the United States, I would argue there's bipartisan consensus amongst Democrats and Republicans on the need to deploy systems like the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense System. That consensus does not extend to space-based missile defenses. Now, the Trump administration has been fairly aggressive uh, in its advocacy for space-based missile defenses. The 2019 Missile Defense Review called for a study to examine this, and I think there was some money uh, in the budget they submitted. However, Democrats in Congress have been very, very, uh, I would say, skeptical for a variety of reasons. One, the cost of a potential space-based missile defense layer. Second, the technical capability. And thirdly, the implications of space-based missile defense for strategic stability. Thank you. Pete? Yes, I will uh, uh, cover the second question, I think, which is uh, about spaceports. And I think uh, spaceports are quite an interesting one. There is a lot of uh, interest uh, uh, about having a spaceport. And, and the question is, why would you want to do that? Well, first of all, geographically, there are uh, some issues to do with where the best places are for uh, spaceports and I'm not going to dive into deep physics because it's too complicated for me but there are better places uh, than others that's one but this but the other reasons are there's a business reason uh, in the sense that there is a, uh, a desire a need for launch capability and people are prepared to pay for it so there is a business reason to have a space launch capability and if you can uh, generate a reliable proven reliable uh, space launch capability, you will be sought after because that's what uh, the operators want. They want to know that they can get their satellites to you, you're going to go on time and uh, and you will put the satellites, give or take, where the person paying for the service uh, wants them to be put. And that's not necessarily uh, entirely true of all the providers today. Um, there's also a national pride issue, without a doubt, you're gonna get away from it. Countries want their own launch capability. We are a space capable nation. We can put vehicles into space. And that sort of pushes back to uh, the question uh, Yoko asked us earlier. And then the, the, the third point is uh, strategic autonomy, if I dare use that phrase, is the ability to uh, have, uh, can I put my own uh, capability into space. Again, being for civilian or defence purposes, it doesn't matter, but do I have the ability to do all this myself? Can I come up with a concept, build a satellite, launch it into space and get the data back? And countries see themselves, I think, as that being good for their protection, for their, uh, for their uh, defence, but also good for their self-esteem. It's a demonstration of, um, of capability, of uh, science and technology, at work very publicly so i think there is competition for spaceports there will be more from a commercial operator in terms of uh, 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 new space that's great because you've got more choice more orbits to have access to and more time more opportunities in terms of time of when you might get into space thank you i have one more blue hand um, from professor kazuto suzuki from japan I think you're on mute. Okay. Um, thank you, Ka, and thank you, uh, panelists. Um, my name is Kazuto Suzuki from Japan. I, um, um, my question is, how do you define the deterrence in space? Um, given the nature of the um, asymmetric uh, balances between the countries, there are a number of growing, growing number of um, uh, commercial actors. So if those commercial actors or the civilian satellites are, uh, are, are targeted by the counter space capability of the hostile nation with some intent, um, how do you see that um, the, how do you prevent them to, to attack on those um, um, important uh, space-based um, um, infrastructure uh, by exercising some sort of a um, deterrence capabilities. Thank you. Hey, uh, who would like to answer first? 
<laughs> yes, I'll go first. Um, you know, I think the whole space deterrence question really depends on where you sit. Um, the bottom line is because the United States is projecting power globally, we are much more reliant on space-based capabilities for military operations. And the Russians and Chinese know this. Um, you know, as Tim mentioned, during the Cold War, uh, space-based capabilities were fundamentally connected with nuclear deterrence. So there was an understanding that you did not go after one space space, your opponent's space space capabilities, because it could potentially uh, create a nuclear war if you did not do it correctly. But that has changed. And the U.S., since, especially since the, the end of the Cold War, has used space space capabilities for conventional military operations. And the Russians and Chinese have been watching, as have others like North Korea and Iran. Uh, and as a result, um, they, we in the United States also thought we were always going to have the sanctuary. The, we do not. You have to give the Russians and the Chinese credit. They have watched how the United States has fought for the last 25 years, and they have developed a specific uh, set of capabilities to underline our key strategic advantage, and that's the ability uh, to use information technologies primarily from space. So we have a vulnerability. I think the most important thing the United States can do over the next five to 10 years is enhance the resiliency of our space systems through the hardening of our satellites, but also looking at other non-space systems that provide redundant capability. Uh, just before the call officially started, uh, the panelists were talking uh, amongst ourselves, and I mentioned that uh, just recently the U.S. Navy started uh, reintroducing celestial navigation into its officers' training program because, um, you know, we had lost that skill because the view was, hey, we have space. Um, yes, we have space, and our adversaries know we have space, so they are trying to undermine our ability to use that. So therefore, we are going to have to distribute our network and become less reliant on space. And, and I would also note that not every threat to space system requires a response in space. And I think as the United States plans for military operations, it needs to ensure that it has a full suite of capabilities so we can respond at a time and a place of our own choosing. Okay, Pete? Yeah, I think um, I can't agree more with what Frank says. And, and, and I think the, issue, the deterrence in space is to get those who might be in adversity in space to uh, have a good hard inward look at themselves and say how could I operate without space and what is the greater loss to me denying space to an adversary or denying space to myself and at the moment I think that balance is finally judged the frightening moment will come is if we start to see actors who have solved uh, the issue, if you like, gone the third way. We, we used to operate without space, although I suppose you could argue celestial navigation had a bit of that in it, but we used to operate without space. Then we've become heavily reliant on space. And then we move to um, a situation where space is useful to us, but it isn't the only uh, methodology we've got, be that for navigation, being it for over the horizon communication. So as on the one side of the coin, the friends, we and the friends have to work out how to be less dependent. Uh, on the other side, we need to make it 
um, clear that denying us space will deny an adversary space and that harm is greater than doing it. But of course, all these issues change with time as technology changes and sometimes we may have to rethink it. But currently, I think for most operators, the loss of space is far greater pain than denying it to the other side. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so Tim, did you have anything to add or? Um, not, not to those questions, but I, I, there's a couple of the, um, the written questions, which if you don't mind, can I, I address one or two of those, which I find particularly interesting? Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. So I think so. It's Oliver uh, Jackins wrote about the um, whether the sort of the, the current common heritage of mankind because of the securitization of space. I think in, in preparation for um, for this webinar, one of the things that I came across is something called the Kessler syndrome. I'm sure some of you might be familiar with this, but it essentially suggests that once a certain critical mass of objects in orbit is reached, that there will be a runaway chain, and then at that point, even if you don't add anything else into orbit. They will just be continue to pieces will break up and break up and break up. And at that point, then, well, space becomes pretty much inaccessible either to, you know, manned or unmanned spaceflight. And, you know, really, as, as Frank has, you know, really emphasized, global to debris is a, is a huge, is a huge threat. And it's not something that's going to go away anytime soon. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about sort of, you know, the uh, dam damage to our oceans and so on like that. And, and you know, the, the atmosphere with, sorry, and with space looking at the amount of damage that's being done there or could potentially be done, um, you know, that's, that's really quite worrying. Um, also, I did see another question about uh, potentially non-state actors uh, conducting cyber attacks against a satellite system. I mean, this is, a, this is a serious worry and it's a serious worry for states as well in, in the United States. Um, every year they host a, a conference whereby they have hackers test the cybersecurity of some of these satellite systems to try to find out where some of the holes are and so they can patch those up. I mean, I think, you know, states are looking at this really seriously and like I say, with a cyber attack, <clears throat> it's very difficult to attribute who launched it. Now, if, if something is, is done to a, a, a very sensitive uh, space-based asset, and fingers start getting pointed, and there might just be a, a non-state actor behind that who doesn't want to reveal you know, what they've done. I mean, you know, that's another worrying thing. And as I spoke about, there is always the risk for escalation dynamics as well. So I think um, the potential threat from a non-state actor um, you know, take, taking advantage of sensitivities around some space-based assets is, is a real worry. Thanks. Thank you, Ted. Okay, I'm Frank. Yeah, let me just pick up on that point that Tim made on the link between cyberspace and outer space. Um, as Tim mentioned in his presentation, there are many ways you can go after space assets. One of the easiest ways is through cyber capabilities for a couple of reasons. One, you don't need a lot of infrastructure. Two, it's very difficult, not impossible, but difficult to attribute. Um, my view is that within kind of the international security committee, uh, community, excuse me, uh, we have had space, cyber, undersea communications, cables, nuclear, all in their own separate silos. So the space people didn't talk to the cyber people, uh, the nuclear people didn't talk to the cyber people and the space people. My view is that as the United States and its allies move forward in the space domain, they need to do it in a way that integrates space with cyber, nuclear, uh, missile defense, undersea communications, because fundamentally, it is all about information technologies. And what we are seeing in the um, area, in the evolution of warfare, is that warfare is increasingly becoming about who can control the information uh, infrastructure or deny people or countries access to information technologies. And I will tell you this, the Russians and the Chinese have an integrated approach to information technologies. 
Uh, Tim, in his presentation, mentioned the Chinese Strategic Support Force, which was established, I think, in 2015-2016. The focus of the Strategic Support Force is just not on space, but it's about the integration of space, cyber, and electronic warfare. The Chinese are on to something. And one of my key recommendations to the U.S. government has they have stood up U.S. Space Command and the U.S. Space Force is ensuring that there are the appropriate links to the other services and combatant commands to ensure that uh, good coordination and integration amongst the information technology domains. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. Uh, did Pete, did you have anything that you wanted to add? I was just, I was just going to, uh, again, support Frank in that it is about managing the information. In the end, the, the space in the main is about getting data. It's about getting hold of that data, knowing it's trusted, safe, secure, and those who should have the data are the ones that have got it. And it sort of turned me to a question from uh, on, on the question board from Sandra Irwin of uh, Space News. And she said the US DOD is studying a future architecture that includes small SAS and they've concerns about vulnerability of LEO assets. What's your prediction about how soon they'll involve a new architecture? Well, I'm not going to try and predict how long it will take uh, the US DOD to create a new architecture, but I make the point that the US is, is very forward thinking in, in, in looking at this new technology and getting their heads around how LEOs can help and equally what the limitations of the LEO satellite capability is and how does that uh, integrate into the more traditional uh, space assets. And I think the key message is that if we're going to do a good job of, prevent, of providing the best uh, information for those of us on the surface to use, then we need uh, uh, assets across the range. There's always a place for big geostationaries, for big maneuverable satellites, and for LEOs to bring uh, the quantity uh, and perhaps lesser capability, but much more of it uh, to the party. And if you put it all together, as Frank said, manage putting that all together in an efficient way, then you are well on your way to having the superiority you need for your own safety. Thank you, Pete. And um, unfortunately, the time has come. Um, so I would like to end the Q&A session. So thank you very much for all of you who have joined the discussion and contributed on um, asking a lot of great questions. And particularly, I would like to thank the speakers who have provided rich insights from their experiences and expertise. And uh, it has become fascinating and interesting discussion. Now, with that, I would like to end this webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>